will take um, you in the order uh, that you appear on the agenda, and that would be uh, Professor Ibs. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Last time I saw you, it was in a beautiful, beautiful day on the Berkeley campus with a bunch of enthusiastic uh, engineering students. Well, that's what I wanted to say to open uh, uh, my remarks here. I wanted to thank you for having me back. I must have done something right the first time. Uh, and I certainly want to thank you uh, for speaking to our students at Berkeley a couple weeks ago. They were really thrilled to have a, a real life politician on the campus and hear your uh, chronology of the Bay Bridge. As, as I told them, excuse me, the reception was much more pleasant than when I go to the journalism school <laughs> when they view me as something as a Cretan from another, another planet. I, I don't know about journalism students. I'll say engineering students tend to be civil. But <laughs> <they're> civil. <laughs> That's very cute. So it's a privilege to be here and to offer some thoughts on the important questions uh, you and your committee are raising. And uh, as I've said before, my um, Thoughts today are offered in the spirit of support and cooperation, and they've been formed by a fair amount of experience on large-scale uh, construction projects around the world, uh, including the Big Dig and the Panama Canal and BART and rail projects in Los Angeles, Seattle, Copenhagen, and Johannesburg. Uh, my, my comments are also framed in the context of the research that I've done on uh, benchmarking of construction projects at Berkeley, over 2,000 large, large-scale large construction projects. And uh, I was pleased to see that your staff decided to reference my paper in the background uh, work for today. Uh, as I understand it, there's really three questions that uh, uh, you want to touch on today. One is the, uh, the propriety or the appropriateness of the performance specs that have been laid out in the business plan. Uh, second, does the business plan provide a, a reasonable roadmap uh, for going, going forward? And thirdly and relatedly, are there alternative pathways that uh, might be considered? Um, I'll start off by saying I may be a bit of a wet rag here uh, to begin with, but uh, uh, I would hope that somewhere, and I am an academic so I can tilt at windmills, uh, I would hope that somewhere along the way that you and your um, colleagues uh, revisit the question of whether we should be uh, devoting this much money to a high-speed rail system uh, when we have pressing problems with our highways, airports, and other uh, civil engineering, uh, other infrastructure facilities. The American Society of Civil Engineers, as you may know, gives report cards to um, the government, uh, and that's at the federal level and the state level, uh, on the condition of infrastructure. And the latest report card for California gives our highways a C minus grade. That's on an A through E scale, and a C minus uh, uh, grade for highways. And they call for spending um, something on the order of $10 billion a year just to maintain those highways and not really uh, lift them up, but just to maintain them. Uh, and where I come from, a C minus is not a passing grade. Um, uh, I would submit to you also that there are a lot more people that will use highways than any rail system, uh, so I would urge you and your, your colleagues to look at transportation investment across the board uh, and give us a world-class transportation system, not just a world-class uh, highway system. And that could go into cargo as well as people. That can go to air, ground, perhaps even sea. And, uh, Having relatives that live in Hay Fork, California, as well as living in Berkeley, California, myself, uh, I'm looking at service across the whole state, not just a few fixed point destinations. However, if the decision is to look at how you're spending money, how we are spending money on uh, rail systems, my research at Berkeley and my uh, exp engineering experience uh, with rail systems tells me that there's some grave financial and operational risks with any type of um, large-scale public project, large-scale construction project. And again, I want to acknowledge the work, uh, the hard-working people at the high-speed uh, rail authority and the, the partners uh, to, the, to, the, uh, so to the agency. Uh, but my work tells me, my research tells me that it's highly probable that the $68 billion or the $52 billion, depending on whether we're talking current dollars or future dollars, that that, that number is probably going to come in bigger than what we're, what we're talking about today. I would not, personally, I would not 
go out on a limb and say a factor of four, but I would say substantially more than the $68 billion. Uh, you, you know, you all know the story of the Big Dig and the Bay Bridge, and I can uh, tell you about uh, similar horror stories in Copenhagen and Johannesburg and how the cost, the capital costs have uh, skyrocketed uh, on those projects, even more so than the, the system advocates or the system critics might have uh, uh, really uh, ever envisioned. And, and you know, I'm working from real world data here. The, the, the projects that I've looked at and benchmarked are real world experiences. They're not, as uh, Mr. Thompson said, paper exercises at this point. Um, I'll also tell you, um, we, we heard Mr. Morales talk about Monte Carlo simulation, and that is a, uh, a preferred tool for doing risk management uh, analysis, but there's Monte Carlo simulation and there's Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, and I haven't uh, had the opportunity to look at the details of what they're doing, but I will tell you that I'm working on a U.S. Department of Energy project in Hanford, Washington, it's called the WTP Waste Treatment Project that has gone from $2.3 billion to $12.8 billion over, uh, since 1999. Uh, and DOE, the Department of Energy, is using Monte Carlo simulation, and they've decided to use not a 50% confidence interval, but what's called an 80% confidence interval. And that means um, that the, the, the numbers they come back with are not 50% likely of happening, but 80% likely happening. So they have chosen to use a higher threshold, a higher confidence interval, if you will, for reporting to Congress and telling Congress what the costs are going to be, telling Congress what the schedule is going to be, and what the operational costs are going to be. So you can use Monte Carlo simulation for not only estimating capital costs, you can use it for estimating other aspects of a project and can use Monte Carlo simulation with different levels of confidence, if you will, confidence, what we call in confidence intervals. So we might want to look at that. You might want to look at that. Um, the second uh, lesson that I've learned from my work is that it generally takes a long time to build these projects. And we've spent most of our time today, I think, talking about the dollars, uh, the writing public, and the people employed by, these, by this system, by this program, are also concerned about when is it going to come online? You know, when, what's the schedule uh, here? And just as, just as you oftentimes see cost growth on these projects, you see, uh, uh, you see um, uh, schedule growth. Uh, the Panama Canal uh, is an example. It's a $5 billion project. And from con uh, concept, by one measure, from con concept, to opening, that was a 15-year project, and it's growing. It's, the schedule is growing on that. And when you're dealing with a 15-year time horizon, it's a lot easier to predict the future than it is to predict a 30-year time horizon, which is something that we may be dealing with here. So time, schedule, completion dates are uh, an, important, uh, an important component I would encourage you to look at. Uh, and uh, along with that, then, uh, as you lengthen the duration of a project or program's development, you run the risk of more interruptions and disruptions, uh, more legal lawsuits, more environmental protests, more permitting processes. So the, the duration of the project, as the pr duration of a project or a program lengthens, uh, so does uh, the further risk that can impede uh, that project. Um, a third issue that I would um, like to highlight is the risks to the operating and maintenance costs, the operations and maintenance costs. We've really not talked about that very much today. I think it's been mentioned one time in passing. And uh, most uh, rail systems in the United States collect only about, as you may know, collect only about two-thirds of their operating costs from the fare box. Okay. And if we have that type of experience on this project, it's going to eat future generations alive. It's going to eat our grandchildren's wallets alive. So uh, we need to look at O&M costs. And as, as you have rightfully called for scenario analysis on the capital costs, I would also encourage you to look at scenario analysis and do risk analysis on the O&M costs. 
Uh, Ed Merrow was a researcher that looked at what were called pioneer projects, and we referred to this back in November. Uh, Ed Merrow was a researcher that looked at um, one-of-a-kind projects, large one-of-a-kind projects back in the 1970s, and he identified uh, that uh, these types of projects, the O&M costs, are uh, frequently more of a, a nightmare than the capital costs themselves. So I just I want to put that out there and put that on, on the record. Um, so what recommendations would I offer in order to manage this, uh, this challenge? Uh, first of all, I would encourage uh, everybody to focus on the connection between scope, project scope, schedule, and costs. As you change the, the scope of a project, that is the characteristics of a project, you can affect the cost and the schedule. Uh, my students learn, because uh, I drill it into them, uh, my students learn that the cost and time to required, required to build any uh, construction system depend on the underlying characteristics of what it is you're building. If it's a house, uh, you know, that's got three bedrooms, it's going to cost X. If it's got four bedrooms, it's going to cost Y. Likewise, we're talking about building a high-speed rail system that could go up to 200 miles an hour. And when you're talking about a system that goes that fast, it has ramifications according to uh, uh, ramifications to line of sight and braking times and acceleration times and risks, especially if there are at-grade co uh, crossings with uh, uh, vehicles or pedestrians. So one thing that you might want to uh, re-examine is the premise that this, this system really needs to run at high speed. I would argue that a system can be world-class, which is our goal, which I think is our goal. It can be world-class and not have to run at that speed. It can have other amenities that are equally attractive and equally supportive uh, and, and useful to the public. But in the scenario analysis that you might be talking about here, you might want to look at uh, the consequences of ramping back or slowing back down to, let's say, a 72 mile an hour uh, type of uh, speed. That's, that's a more conventional arrangement. So, first thing is uh, to, to look at and, and, and look at the trade offs between scope, cost, and time uh, uh, as, as you go forward with this. My second uh, recommendation uh, concerns the interaction of this system with, or the interconnection of this system with uh, local uh, distribution systems. Uh, when the rail systems of Europe and Japan uh, are successful, it's because they tie into a local system, whether it's a local rail system like BART or whether it's a bus system, uh, there is a comprehensive integrated plan, and that may involve bringing different agencies together and getting them all to work, work together and pull, pull in the same direction. Uh, I would hope that, uh, uh, that this um, authority uh, keeps its eye on how it's going to team up with these local agencies and, and feed passengers into the local, um, uh, the local uh, municipalities or the local regionals. Uh, and it might also involve inter interconnecting with, uh, or looking at interconnection with the private sector as well. I mean, uh, in the past 10 years, we've had uh, organizations like Uber uh, grow up and be very popular. Uh, could that be a partner to um, uh, this type of uh, system that would make it more affordable and um, convenient for the writing, the writing public? The last point I'll make, um, it uh, goes back to something I once heard Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, say, and I really like, I like what he has to say because I think it's so appropriate in life. He's, he said uh, in so many words that over the course of three years, things change much slower than we expect, but over the course of ten years, things change much more dramatically than we can ever imagine. Okay? And if we're talking about a 30-year time horizon or a multi-decade decade time horizon here, we could have multiple generations of, of technology, multiple generations of, of humans that are uh, dealing with this. Uh, my students uh, today, the younger, the younger generation, those young whippersnappers, you know, are very um, convenient. They're very comfortable dealing with uh, technology and Skype and GoToMeeting and tools like that in interviewing or applying to college, and they don't feel the need 
to go to an employer or go to a friend's house and meet with that person face to face. So the types of things that we might be looking at 30 years down the road could be totally different than what we're envisioning right now. So I do think that the, the risk management approach, a broad um, approach towards risk management is really important on this. Again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to offer some thoughts today. Uh, and my, my, my hope is that these thoughts are taken in a constructive and positive and helpful attitude and uh, be willing to answer any uh, questions uh, at the appropriate time. Thank you and good luck. Thank you, Professor Ibs. Um, your last comments remind me of a conversation I had with Elon Musk where he was talking about his Hyperloop. Um, have you or your students looked at that project at all? Yeah, I was asked to uh, look at the Hyperloop and offer some thoughts about that. So he, he commented to me, I hope this is not inappropriate um, from our conversation, but it was Mr. Musk's opinion as expressed to me is uh, why would California want to invest in infrastructure that is 20 years old or so, he, I don't know if he said 20, but it's past its time. So his response, and I read the RAND report in the 70s because I was interested before I went and talked to him. So RAND did a study about the feasibility of a Hyperloop. And um, it's really pretty fascinating. So you've done, you've been asked to, and do you have any comments about it, about its? Yeah, what, you know, he's, um, he's promoted a system that would conceivably be built at a fraction of what this right. uh, proposed system would cost. But again, he's not talking about operating and maintenance costs either. No one's talking about the O&M costs. Right. In my opinion, they're not talking about it enough, okay? And I think his O&M costs would far outstrip his capital costs and you would never be able to transport a person from Northern California to Southern California for $20 uh, a ticket as he's uh, uh, offering. Um, you know, he's got some clever technology, uh, some clever motive technology that he's thinking about. Um, it'd be interesting to lie at about a 45 degree angle and, and ride at the speeds that he's talking about, uh, but it also might be a little claustrophobic in uh, in some of those capsules. It's depending what, what never mind. Uh, it, it, it would be helpful, I think, we've had lots of discussions over the years uh, in this committee and in Senator Simidian's committee, now Senator Bell in the Fiscal Committee, talking about what, what are um, different scenarios on the operating and maintenance size. So what is Fairbox recovery? Are there systems in the world that are truly um, self-sustaining and Mr. Morales may, I know we've had this discussion, uh, what subsidized, what degree of subsidy, how do you separate the capital from the oper operations and maintenance and the debt service and uh, it'd be interesting to know what your experience is and if you care to make brief comments and then we'll go to Mr. Dyson. Well, I, I do know that there have been certain studies uh, decades ago that looked at even uh, driverless cars. So that dra dramatically changes the, over, uh, the operating and maintenance costs. I don't know whether the uh, High Speed Authority has looked at that as a, a conceivable option, but that would be a starting point. If you really want to think outside the box, think outside of the car without, uh, think of a car without having a driver. Okay. Well, we'll think outside the <laughs> box.